Good morning, everybody. We are back. Mastering Diagnostics. We're up to video number 11 already. Time's flying. This is going to be the second video in my little mini series I like to call Learning How to Learn. Now, if you recall from MD number 10, we spent time analyzing a coilover plug ignition system that included the inputs and the outputs. In other words, battery voltage supply to the coil, ground supply to the coil, command from the PCM going to the coil, and of course the work being performed, the current flow for the entire ignition system. Um, we then implemented the lab scope to capture that for analysis, and we were able to compare the performance of each ignition coil in turn from one to the next, proving that they all sim work similarly. And the benefit of doing that, capturing data like that, so a story is being told, is if indeed we did have a problem, it would show up there and we'd be able to count out through the firing order, knowing which ignition coil we were referencing, which ignition coil actually had a problem. So today's theme is going to follow through with the same techniques we used, researching the wiring diagram for starters, so we get an idea of what to anticipate as far as how the system functionality is configured, and two, where to place our test leads when we capture the data to capture the story that's to be told. But we're going to do something a little bit differently other than analyzing the wiring diagram and implementing the color coding technique that George Menchu from AES Wave taught us. We are going to do something a little bit different today. We are going to be introducing a fault. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to capture um, command to one of my engine's fuel injectors, just like we did for the ignition coil. On a second channel, I'm going to be measuring current flow to all of the fuel injectors. On a third channel, I am going to be monitoring the crankshaft position sensor signal. And on a fourth channel, I'm going to be monitoring the camshaft position sensor signal. Again, why did I choose those points of interest for testing? Um, obviously, the work being performed is what we need to see to evaluate the performance of the system, or in this case, one of the individual fuel injectors. Two, we need to see the command from the PCM to drive the injector in case the performance isn't there. We want to see if the PCM is giving the command. If the PCM is not giving the command, we have to check the inputs that the PCM references to make the decision on if to turn the fuel injector on and for how long to keep it on. If the inputs aren't there, the output isn't going to be there. In other words, garbage in, garbage out. A PCM is not a smart device. It's very swift at making decisions and very capable of maintaining very fine control of whichever, com whichever component it's driving. That's the benefit of computerized, in this case, fuel injection. But by no means is a computer smart. It's simply programmed to look at inputs and make decisions upon an output. And what output is that? In this case, it's the fuel injector pulse width. So as discussed, let's follow through with service information to get an idea how the system works, what to anticipate. And then we will reference the wiring diagram like we did in a previous video to color code it so we can get our scope set up properly. So the first thing I did was reference my service information system. Frequently, you guys will see me use all data. And it's not that I like all data better than any of the other service information system platforms. They all have their ups and they all have their downs. They're all great and they're all terrible. It just depends on which vehicle you're looking at. The good news is, is you don't find what it is you're looking for. You can always reach out to them for help and they will send you the information. They'll find it for you and send it over to you in a relatively swift time. But what we have here is information for my vehicle, my 2006 Honda Civic. And what I'm going to research here is the crankshaft position sensor functionality. So if I read the description here, and this might be too small, so I'll just read it out loud for you. The crank sensor detects crankshaft speed and is used by the computer to determine ignition timing and timing for fuel injection for each cylinder, as well as detecting engine misfire. So this is the key portion of the phrase here. Determines timing for the fuel injection. In other words, when to initiate turn on and when to initiate turn off. 
almost like a conductor of a symphony or an orchestra. Now, if we go backwards and research the camshaft position sensor, the sensor itself works very similar to the crank sensor, but it does something a bit different. This detects the position of the number one cylinder as a reference for sequential fuel injection. Sequential meaning in a sequence. In other words, in years past, we would gang fire or group fire or bank fire fuel injectors. In other words, four injectors would go to one switch or one driver in a computer. That's a tremendous waste of fuel. So because we have a cam sensor, not only, but with the crank sensor, we can detect top dead center of cylinder number one, but we don't know if it's top dead center compression or top dead center exhaust. We have no idea where within the cycle it is. We just know the crank angle space. However, when we add the cam sensor input, the cam only goes around once per engine cycle. So that tells us when to start our fuel injector sequence. In other words, the crank sensor is responsible for the timing of the fuel injector operation. The cam sensor determines when to start with number one. So these two work together to establish and determine when to fire cylinder number one uh, fuel injector and then carry out with the firing order. And the crank sensor tells us when to initiate each one of the injectors in that firing order. So let me first explain what's going on here. I've taken the opportunity to cut and paste the wiring diagram referencing the fuel injectors here in the middle of the screen. And then I took a little snippet of the wiring diagram for the inputs, the crank sensor and the cam sensor, and I pasted it right here just for convenience so we can see everything on one screen. I'm going to be placing my blue channel of my scope on the crankshaft position sensor signal wire. I'm going to be placing the red channel on the camshaft sensor signal wire going to the PCM. I'm going to be placing the green channel on injector number one uh, control wire, the ground side of the circuit between the PCM and the injector, the control side. And I'm going to be placing the yellow channel um, at fuse number 19 with my amp probe. Just like in video one in the series, we go to the fuse for a couple reasons. One, it's convenient. And two, it provides information pertaining to not one, not two, not three, but all four fuel injectors. Now, I want to warn you, you have to keep in mind the wiring diagram. This fuse not only feeds the fuel injectors, but it also feeds other wiring diagrams here and here and here. I've checked those out, and those do not consume a lot of current, meaning they're not going to make a big difference in the waveform we obtain here. But if, for instance, this one of these wires fed, let's say, ignition coils, we would see waveforms from the fuel injectors and the ignition coils on the same channel. And under certain conditions, they might stack upon one another. So if you're not aware of that, that could look very strange to you. And you always have to be aware of that. That's why we always reference wiring diagrams. Because sometimes the fuse isn't the greatest place to go, depending on how many different components it feeds. It might be more beneficial for me to hang my amp probe at connector C101, that one from uh, the previous video, right near the brake master cylinder. But I'm going to go right here because, as I said, these branches of the circuit leading out in other areas are not high energy consuming devices. They're not going to interrupt our, our waveform. They're not going to disrupt our waveform or create any confusion for us. So, again, inputs, crank sensor, cam sensor, go to the PCM. The PCM makes the decision based upon these two when to fire injector number one, right, where to begin the sequence, the firing order of the injectors, and I'm sorry, that's the cam sensor. And the crank sensor is going to tell us the frequency, how often to fire those injectors. So we're ready to head out to the car, connect our scope and our amp probe, and capture the data. Again, the story to be told, the inputs versus the outputs, and the work being performed in the circuit. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to back probe 
my crankshaft position sensor and or my camshaft position sensor. I haven't decided yet. And I am going to, as the engine runs and we are collecting this data, I'm going to provide a momentary short to ground on that signal. I'm going to disrupt that signal. And as I mentioned earlier, the way a PCM works, the way a computer works, is it processes inputs and makes a decision for the output. So if we get garbage in, we're going to get garbage out. And we're going to see that reflected in our scope capture. And I'll explain that scenario when we analyze the data a little bit later on. Let's head out to the car and capture this. All right, so we're at the car. I'll show you what I got going on here. My PC connected to my four tray scope. Got the scope grounded. Shared ground. We've got our blue lead connected to our crankshaft position sensor signal wire. Our red lead is supposed to be connected to our camshaft position sensor wire, but it's way down there. I just can't get to it. I could also get to it here at the PCM, but we're just going to omit that from today because that's, that's far too much work for out here in the parking lot. And I've got the third channel, green, on the fuel injector control wire, and the fourth one on fuse number 19 which would be our amp probe connected to the fuel injection 15 amp fuse. So we'll start the car, capture the data, implement the fault, and see what happens. Okay, so the scope is running. On my crankshaft position sensor signal, wire going up to my scope, with this Pierce probe is a T, I've back probed what's going to be a ground lead to my crankshaft position sensor signal. So we're gonna be grounding the signal momentarily and see how the car behaves. It might hiccup, it might stall. We'll see what happens. But we're going to be recording this. Ready? Three. So it captured the stall. Uh, I was hoping to be swift enough so it would just hiccup. But unfortunately it stalled. Uh, I'm going to try one more time to see if I can get it to recover. And either way we're going to go down back into the, uh, to the office and analyze the data. So we're back from outside of the vehicle. And two things I want to mention. One... I couldn't easily get to the camshaft position sensor signal. I tried dearly to get to it at the back of the cylinder head, but I just couldn't get to it. Another option would be for me to go to the PCM, but to get to the PCM on this one, I'd have to remove the battery and, and disconnect a lot of stuff. And I just didn't think it was necessary for this video. So we're gonna proceed with analysis, omitting the camshaft position sensor. Another thing I want to mention is when I mentioned the placement of the amp probe, and I cautioned you earlier that depending on how the vehicles or that circuit is configured, that fuse that you're referencing may feed other components. Uh, I also mentioned it's not going to be too bad on this vehicle because it doesn't make a lot of noise. It doesn't handle a lot of heavy current drawing components. I was a little wrong on that. It's a bit noisy. We can analyze it just fine but we don't see the detail we want to see simply because of the noise. You'll see what I'm talking about when I point it out. But anyhow, let's get to it. Let's pull up the, the capture and, and go over it. We'll analyze it together. So we've got the capture up on the screen. In green is our fuel injector for cylinder number one. In blue is our crankshaft position sensor signal wire. In red would have been our camshaft signal but I did not connect it to the vehicle, again, because it was very, very inaccessible. And in yellow is our amp probe trace. So what I'm gonna do is, as you, as you can see, if you look across this, relatively even pulses as the vehicle idles. However, right here, there's a couple of missing pulses, and that is where I created the anomaly. I, I grounded the crankshaft position sensor signal wire momentarily. Um, the one you saw on video was an actual stall. I didn't want to use that one because we wouldn't get to see what it is I'm trying to show you here. I repeated the capture a subsequent time and very momentarily touched ground to that signal wire, created a short, and, and got it to hiccup. So we've got our injector number one in green, our crank sensor signal in blue, and our amperage for all four fuel injectors in yellow. And as you can see, in one complete cycle, two rotations of the engine, 
we've got one rotation of the camshaft and one, two rotation of the crankshaft. In that one engine cycle, there are one, two, three, four injector pulses because this is a four cylinder engine. We have another healthy cycle here, one, two, three, four. And then this happens. One, two, three, four. Here, if you look closely, I created the ground path for the crank sensor. This is me striking ground with a back probe, with, with a pierce probe. What that did was create the fault we see visible here. Let me back up again. One, two, three, four, a good cycle. One good pulse, then I created the fault. And because I created that fault, the PCM lost its timing and one of the injector pulses is missing because of that hiccup. So we've got one, this would be two, this would be three and four. One, two, three, four, and then we start the process over again. And something else you can see here, a moment later, look at how these pulses begin to spread out. They're spreading out because the engine has slowed down. If I zoom out just a little bit more, you can see the difference between these two pulses and this big pulse. There isn't a missing pulse here. One, two, three, four. It's just the engine is slowing down because of that hiccup. So you can see the chain reaction. Now, when you create your own experiments like this, you can learn from it because you're in control. This is what has allowed me to develop my solid diagnostic approach with drivability symptoms, seemingly unsolvable problems that have been all over the place, multiple shops, sometimes in multiple states. We tend to find with ease when we have a game plan, we understand how things work. So I hope you're starting to get the hang of it. And when I say get the hang of it, I mean learning how to learn, taking the time to do some research and understand how systems work, how the individual components work together to accomplish a goal. In this case, establish a fuel injector pulse and when that pulse is supposed to occur. By creating experiments, by messing with the inputs, we affected the outputs. And this is going to help someone in the long run when they're chasing an intermittent, perhaps short to ground, and, and a stall occurs or a misfire occurs. And when we're looking at the amp probe, current trace, we're seeing the work being performed. If that work disappears, we simply work our way backwards. So these seemingly impossible to solve problems, the ones that I tend to see most of the time, they've been everywhere and they cannot be fixed. Many of them are quite easy to fix. And it's not that I'm any better at what I do than any of you. It's that I've taken the time to gain an understanding of how things work to understand the limitations of my tools, what they can and cannot show me, and to have access to good service information so I can educate myself on the vehicle I'm working on. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Mastering Diagnostics. I'm Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine, and I'll catch you guys next time. For number three in the series, we're going to be messing with engine mechanical. Make sure I see you there.